Hello, I'm Alex. And I'm Kelly. And welcome to the LitJoy podcast. This episode is brought to you by LitJoy Crates Holiday Events. All through November, December, readers can shop new gifts for readers in their life or for yourself and can shop special sales events. The holiday season is literally our favorite time of year at LitJoy. Myself and Kelly work with our team year-round to bring to life the perfect gifts for readers. If you're a fan of Sarah J. Moss, we have lots of items available, but new this season is the Throne of Glass Key. For classic book lovers, we've released the Lit Joy edition of A Christmas Carol, and there's a darling door knocker ornament that can correlate with it. And perhaps the thing that we're most excited about is our paper art edition of Alice in Wonderland. There will be special discounts happening throughout the month of November and December, so please keep checking back in. If you're a listener tuning in when it's not the holiday season, don't worry, we've got you covered. You can use the code PODCAST10, that's P-O-D-C-A-S-T-1-0, at litjoycrate.com slash podcast anytime for 10% off. So PODCAST10 is a 10% off discount that doesn't expire. And the way to navigate to our website is litjoycrate.com slash podcast, L-I-T-J-O-Y-C-R-A-T-E dot com slash P-O-D-C-A-S-T. That's where you can find everything we talk about on the podcast as far as products and sales events go. And of course, all of this info will be in the show notes. Hello, reader. In this episode, I, myself, Alex, and Kelly my co-host and LaJoy co-owner, are going to be discussing one of the hottest fantasy novels that has come out in 2023. I know you're all thinking it. It's Fourth Wing. We're very excited for this to be our premiere book club type episode. And we're just going to jump right into it and having a conversation about this book. So and we do want to let you know that there will be spoilers throughout this episode. So If you have not read Fourth Wing and you don't want to be spoiled, now's the time to pause this episode, bookmark it, save it, so that you can come back to it after you read the book. So this is one of our very first, you know, book club type formats, like Alex mentioned, for a book. And anytime we are doing a book club discussion on the podcast, just as an FYI for everybody, there will be spoilers. I don't know how to talk about a book fully without getting into all the deets. So... We will not be withholding, is what we're saying. For sure. So, last warning there. Um, and then in regards to the book itself, do we feel like we want to give a quick synopsis? or Yeah, let's maybe like kind of talk about who we would recommend the book to. Okay. Um, because I feel like this is a very unique book, and we'll get into it more in the discussion. But I personally, if I was going to recommend this book, I would recommend it to people who really enjoyed Sarah J. Moss. I feel Mm -hmm. like if you read Sarah J. Moss, that's a really great starting point for there's so many people who have read Sarah J. Moss. And so if you've read that and enjoyed it, I think you'd enjoy this. Absolutely. Yep. And I also would recommend it to anyone who loves medium spice romance novels. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I'm like, what else? Who else would be like a good a good comparison? Well, so the main characters are like 2023. 20, so this is not considered young adult. This would be more of an yes. adult fantasy. There are dragons in this book and lots of action. Um, so I kind of think that's a good reason as to why the book is so popular. There's a little bit of everything in this book for everyone. And I have yet to find someone who I've talked to who hasn't been like, oh my gosh, I love that book. Yeah. I love it. People are loving it. And even if it's not someone's like favorite book of the year, they're like, oh my gosh, I would still read it. It's It's a book that has just really caught momentum because mm-hmm. it's kind of like like eating cake. You're just like, I could just keep eating it. It's delicious. <laughs> it's like a book that's totally delicious to, yes. to consume. Um, and it has, I mean, all the tropes and cliches that you want in a really great romance, but also kind of like How to Train Your Dragon. It's mm-hmm. like meets, yeah, like How to Train Your, like a romance meets How to Train Your Dragon. So if you just want like a delightful escape into a really fun fantasy read. Mm-hmm. Pause the episode, go dive into it. And by the time this episode comes out, I'm pretty sure book two in the series will have released. Ooh, yes. Iron Flame comes out November 9th, I think. Mm-hmm. If I remember right. So I'm very excited. I know. It, you know, book one leaves that cliffhanger. Okay. Apparently we just need to jump we in stop. here. So stop. I won't give like a book synopsis because I feel like, um, 
people can do that on their own cool. instead of us using the time for that because I want to talk about the book. Let's do it. Let's dive in. So um, now is where you hit pause if you don't want spoilers. Otherwise, we're jumping right into the discussion questions. So let's start with a little bit about Rebecca. Love it. And talk about Rebecca Yaros, who is kind of a badass romance author. Yeah. Okay. She kind of just, I mean, for a lot of us, just popped up out of nowhere, unless you were really in the mainstream romance field of Mm -hmm. books. Um, From what I'm like, let me look at my notes here, because she's written over 20 novels, which includes Fourth Wing. But up until now, all of them have been just straight romance. So I love that she's like, let me try out a new genre. Of course, I'm going to put some of my staple in there, romance, which I very much appreciated. Um, and the other books that are mentioned for her is The Last Letter, The Things We Leave Unfinished. And she's won several awards for um, a lot of her romance books. And I know her husband just retired, I think, a year ago from the military. Mm-hmm. And she's been married for about 20 years. She's got six kids. They've got... Um, dogs and cats so i oh, love yeah. it she's just got like the whole farm going on and yep. um yeah she's uh seems really down to earth from the things i've seen and read about her um and this just took off it was it's been incredible to watch because uh i think she was like let me just try this new genre see how it goes yeah and then the response was immediate and addictive for everybody. And they couldn't put the books out fast enough. They kept redoing reprints, reprints. Yes. Um, all these special edition boxes putting out editions as well. And the publisher having to do new editions. So that's quite the testament to how quickly um, this book has caught fire. Yep. And I'm so happy we don't have to wait like too long for book Dragon two. Dragon fire. I'm all, ba-dum, ba-dum. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I did see, I saw in an interview with Rebecca, um, she talked about how actually the publisher came to her uh, and was like, and it might have been in collaboration with her agent and editor, but uh, essentially they came to her and they were like, we want something in uh, the fantasy genre from you. So she kind of got, you know, like, ah. like they kind of proposed to her, they're like, the next thing you do, let's do something in this genre. And so it was more of like a, a collaborative decision and so i think she pitched multiple books to the publisher mm. and they came back and they're like we want dragons and she was kind of like of all my pitches you want dragons and she's like okay let's do this and it was such obviously it was the right choice like yeah. the book has just totally gone viral um but it's it's so interesting because i think um a lot of times we kind of will meet with premier authors mm. and it's their first book and they write the book that they really want to write. But a lot of times with other authors, like publishers will kind of um, have spaces to fill. And they're like, or, or they think an author has the potential to be really successful at something. And mm-hmm. so that's an interesting, I thought that was an interesting behind the scenes perspective. Yeah, That sometimes that. the publisher will kind of push for something or ask for something. And and I think that that's kind of, it pulls an author uh, I, I think it strengthens their portfolio. Like it makes them a better author when they get to try new genres. Yeah. And I was like, Rebecca seemed very comfortable in fantasy. Yeah. I thought it, it was did great. not seem like her first fantasy mm-hmm. by any means, especially because no. she's created such a complicated, dynamic magic system and world, yep. which we'll get into. We keep flirting. We'll do it. Flirting we'll with do it, it right now. Why do you think this book was so hyped? <laughs> I love, this is like talking about sociology, psychology. So yeah. I'm like, why was Fourth Wing the book That just took off this year? I mean, my first guess was just like, we've kind of talked about it already, which is, I think there's like every trope that we love in one book. (laughs) This book has, like I said, everything in it, which maybe shouldn't work so well, but it works so well. And yeah, it's like addicting, like chocolate cake. I loved the, you know, for a minute there, I'm like, okay, is there a love triangle? Okay, wait, no, over here, there's like enemies to lovers. There's this grumpy sunshine. There's also this new, um, it's like a a magical school, right? Which is also really addictive, but it's to train dragon riders with dragons. And I'm just like, yes. And the fact- Academy of dragon riders. You're all, you had me at Academy. (laughs) (laughs) And I love that the dragons can speak with their riders. We don't always Mm -hmm. get that. No, you normally yeah, that like telepathic ability. Yes. That's super fun. And then on top of we get okay, so Violet and um Zayden. 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 I almost said Xavier. Wow. Well, sure. Uh, Violet and <laughs> Zayden, who are the main characters. Um I 
the when they had their two dragons who are bonded. Oh yes, that, <laughs> let's go right to the. I'm just the, like okay. I'm jumping ahead. I know. No, but do it. That went for me. I was just like, um, okay. I'm so sold. I was like to remind you, readers. Uh, so there's a moment in the book where they so. Violet bonds with two dragons, which is like forbidden. You can only bond with one. It's just never been done. Right. But the dragons are like, bitch, we do whatever we want. And so the humans are like, okay, you're right. You breathe fire. We won't do anything about it. Accurate. Just, <laughs> I should do book synopses for my job. <laughs> Anyways, um, so the uh, the larger and older of the dragons that Violet bonds to, that become she becomes his writer, he has... Taryn. Yeah, uh, yeah. Taryn is the dragon's name. He has a a he's a lady lover, friend, <laughs> a lover, a <laughs> lifelong lover. Sigail. Uh, and she is, of course, Violet's arch enemy. Is that arch enemy? Arch yeah. enemy, Zayden. Yeah. Like because their parents. Well, okay. Her mom executed Zayden's dad, so that's always fun. So they hate each other <laughs> on principle, of course. Yes, and their dragons are lovers and when they're dragons <laughs> do whatever dragons do to have sex because who knows they feel it through the telepathic bond so they're just both having a cigarette in the courtyard and i'm like this is fantastic they're both just like, like gritting their teeth trying to get through it and yeah they're like oh. we cannot make love like our dragons of course that's forbidden romance i just like it's delicious right yum yum <laughs> i'm like they give in a little bit but oh 100 percent. oh just to be clear there is like sex in the book. Yeah. So like it does get spicy. I'm like, she's a romance writer. That's the best part. I know. Is that she brings that in. But it's true. Just the idea that they, okay, so they're bonded because their dragons are bonded. Yes. They're mates. They're mated. And because of that, this has also never really been discussed or talked about, or I don't know if it's even happened. All four of them become bonded. All yes. four of them are like, have to keep each other alive. They have to stay close to one another or else they can literally die. Mm -hmm. If one of them dies, it can cause the others to die. It's a whole thing. And they can hear the other person's dragon as well, not just their own. And so yes. I was just, I remember reading that part in the book and I was just like, oh my gosh, this yeah, is going to be so, so awesome. Like three dragons and two humans are all just besties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, this is so great. It's such good content. But I'm yeah. like taking it back to like, Rebecca putting all that romance in the book. Mm. I'm all, I think it's popular because I think it filled a hole in publishing that uh, Sarah J. Moss created. I'm like, I know that there's other books out there that are doing this really well. And I think just every now and then one of them goes viral, like Fourth Wing. Mm. But I do think, I mean, we were kind of there for the whole transition into like new adult or that merging of like romance genre into fantasy. Because before that, a lot of fantasy was kind of a fade to black situation. Yeah. Like if you think about just the big books like Twilight that was kind of a precursor and and um, like Hunger Games and um, yeah, Divergent, all of them, it's not as sexy. And so I feel like. No. <laughs> no. Um, but they're great books. Yeah. But yeah, so I they're I, all like stepping stones yeah. to like pushing the literature in certain directions, right? Yeah, and so, like what people our readers are responding to. Yeah, and I don't like tell me if this is okay to share. Okay. <laughs> but um, I use a, a website, you know, that uh, publishers use, um, where they put all their information for books coming up. You know, with the with our job, so I'm you know yes. looking for books that are up and coming the next year blah 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 but through the website i can see what the order numbers are for all these books for their first print runs and mm -hmm. i thought it was fascinating for fourth wing i mean it was like i, I can't remember exactly but i'm gonna just round pick a number like let's say it was around two hundred thousand for like the first print run which is still a pretty high first that's print a run. great first print run like that's pretty yeah. high mm-hmm Iron Flame <laughs> was about a million copies, yep. I remember right, for the first print run. So that just shows in the last year how popular this is getting. I have never, I, maybe, maybe one of Sarah's, Sarah J. Moss's books have gotten that high of a print run. Yeah. For the, the first, first print. One. I was, I like had to refresh it. I'm like, wait, that can't be right. I was like, I've never seen it that high, but wow. I know. It just like, I think too, part of releasing a book with like, book talk and mm. bookstagram is it just gives it that power to get viral because it's not just the bestseller list which the bestseller lists are 
doing a lot to market this book, but also the, I think that you can just pick up a lot of traction on social media. And I feel mm-hmm. like Fourth Wing was all over TikTok for a little while and stuff. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. And like book clubs are picking it up. It's getting recommended. Also, I feel like Jennifer Armentrout. Yeah. I feel like a lot of her books are in this genre, too. Mm. And so there's so many people who love Jennifer's work, too, which it's great. Yeah. So, yeah, it's fun. I was, I'm like, let's dive into some more questions. I know. Okay. okay. We're just geeking out still. I know. I know. I know. Um, so yeah. I'll, the, I'll, you want me to do this one? Yeah, go for it. Okay. We kind of have a few questions that we're just looking at. But, okay. you know, when Zayden is talking about Violet and he's like, you look all frail and breakable, but you're really a violent little thing, aren't you? You know, that's where her nickname comes in. He calls her violence. Because her name is Violet and he's all, hello, violence. And I'm just like, that works for me. Yeah. Why is that working? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, at the beginning of the book, Violet sees herself that way. She's like, I'm a scribe. I'm bookish. Like, I'm frail and we'll get into that a little bit more too but and then her mom basically was like i don't care what you want to be doing in your life forget the scribe stuff you are going to now be a dragon rider everyone in our family is a dragon rider so are you and she's very unprepared and yeah. has not been prepping or planning at all for this yes she wants to be a scribe which is basically like a professional librarian in a sense mm-hmm. like um, a and, erudite <laughs> yeah yeah they just yeah. they they seek knowledge right and so that's i love that's her go-to when she's trying to relax is she just recites information and facts but basically my question is um so zayden i think picks up kind of quickly that she's not what she appears to be mm-hmm. you know and do we think zayden and her mom or one or the other can see that she is going to be an incredible dragon rider like or do we think that they both were totally expecting her to fail? So I'm curious to know from your perspective um, about her mom mm-hmm. and what we think she was doing there. Was it intentional to save her or to possibly not save her? I don't know if she's trying to off her daughter yeah. or not because that's a lot of theory going around. But Fascinating. I think there's a couple things here. So I think there's kind of two options with Zayden. I feel like right when he first met her on the parapet, because, you know, the, that first scene where she has to cross this parapet in like the wind and rain in order to even enter the Dragon Academy, essentially. Um, she takes off one of her boots because she's wearing like like industrial grippy boots that make sure she can't fall. Right. They, they keep her on the parapet without falling to her death. <laughs> that her sister Welcome. gave to her. Yeah, her sister gave them to her. Um, and so she gives one of them away immediately to a girl she just met because she can see that the girl is wearing boots that would easily slip. And so she gives one boot away knowing that they both have one good boot so they have, both have a better chance of making it. And that's when Zayden meets her. And I feel like in that moment, he was just like immediately physically attracted to her, but also attracted to like her goodness and her humanity And she is different than a lot of the writers there. She's a different personality type. And so I think that there's something really attractive about somebody who's really different than you. Like you're drawn to them. And so I think he just physically and and personality-wise was drawn to her right away and felt like she could be special to him. But also it's that forbidden romance that I think also is just like really creates that tension between characters. Um, And there is the potential though that he could see something in her that's like deeper or that it could be alluded to things to come in future books about his ability to read her, to know how powerful she is. I think her mom, on the other hand, for sure knows what's going on with her. I think that that's something that's not revealed to the readers in book one. But I think clearly she has the ability because she has when she manifests a power like when you bond with a dragon, you manifest a power, essentially. And hers is lightning. And it, Xander goes, doesn't he? Or Zayden. Zayden goes, I knew it. Like, it's lightning, right? Like, I knew that. And so there's something else going on there with, like, her abilities that I think her mom has an inkling of knowledge about or something. She knows something about it. Mm. And I think that Zayden has kind of figured it out or he's on, like, the trail. So, because when they have their very first like forbidden kiss, oh yes, she like just lets go, you know, and it's yeah. just like totally in that kiss, and that's when the lightning shoots from behind him. Mm-hmm. And I think that's when Zayden's all, I 
Interesting. <laughs> He's a uh, noted. <laughs> <laughs> also, I did that. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're like shadow and lightning. So like his his yeah. signet or his sig is it signet signet. It's um his power is like shadow wielding or something like that. Yes, which yeah. felt very resand to me. Oh yes, and I was like, it's still working. This is great. <laughs> still works today. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But what do you think about as a follow up question? What do you think about the death of of uh, Violet's father? Because I feel like her abilities are somehow connected to the mystery of her father's death. Mm. And I'm like, what are your pet theories on what's going on with that? There's definitely a lot of theories about this been going around, but it it's not adding up, right? Like as right. you learn more, like, like especially a healthy towards the man end, man in his like 40s, yes, who is a scribe, right? Like, yes. Um, and so him and Violet used to bond on that and share books. He even had this like forbidden, almost like fable for fairy tale book that he passed on to Violet that she kept, and all these pieces start coming together at the end where she's like, what was he trying to tell me? And in the, in the year after Brennan, which is their son that was killed. Yes. For older brother. Yes. Um, she mentions how my dad was not for quite the same and more cryptic. Yes. That, like towards the last year, basically of his life, the year you know, after Brennan died. And so I'm like, something was going on there. He knew things. Right. And so a lot of the theory is that he was murdered. But the question is whether it was Violet's mom or not. Mm -hmm. Is it Lilith Sorendell? I think it's Lilith. All of yeah. a sudden, names are flying like, out of my like brain. Like the goddess of hell. And so we're like, okay, did she kill him? Is she trying to cover all this up? Or did somebody else do it? Right. Like, who is it? I think it could go either way with Lilith. Like, I think either it could be her who is, in, she is responsible for these series of murders or dangerous situations mm. that Violet is in and that her husband, like his mysterious death, I, or she's on to whoever's doing this to her family. Mm. And she knows that Violet can be really powerful. And so she makes sure she gets in the writer squadron, makes sure that she bonds with the dragon so that she's able to join the rebellion. Right. Mm. Because in the end of the book, you find out that Zayden is part of the rebellion and so is her supposedly dead brother right yeah and so I think that I there's just, I'm like could she not do anything to help Violet along the way if she was trying to help her because she's so cold and distant to her the whole time oh yeah like nothing and so I think that's where I'm just like I cannot get a read on it so I, that's probably the point <laughs> I'm like like if there was any easter eggs that's where I'm like the only easter egg that we know of is <clears throat> excuse me the dagger that we know is on her desk that can kill Wyvern, correct? Yeah. Well, and the the venom, the, the venom, venom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Which there's Zayden also has one, right? Mm -hmm. And so she's like, "Why does my mom need one?" Yes. So uh, there is Wyvern and Venon, who are essentially like f the venom used to be human, but they've let mm -hmm. magic kind of intoxicate like, them. To it's the, like dark magic has corrupted yeah, them to the point where they're they're kind of evil. They kind of remind me of like on Dungeons and Dragons, the movie that the lady with like the red, oh, like vagina or like the witcher, cloak. <laughs> the vagina. Cloak. I was <laughs> yes. like, it kind of reminds me of the witcher, yeah, like the witcher when like he their takes eyes. his potion. Oh yeah, because it gets like these red eyes. Anyway, so these supposedly folklore people and their dragons, which are wyvern, exist, but they. Forever didn't think they did. Yeah. Well, the propaganda yeah. in Violet's country is that they don't exist, that they're just a myth. And obviously, spoiler, like, they do. I was like, <laughs> obviously they exist. Like anything in fantasy novels where they're like, it could never happen. I'm going to assume that's going to happen. That exact thing <laughs> is going to happen. Um, and so they come into the, you know, there, there's like a battle scene and they're there. And, um, and there's a specific type of metal that can kill them. Yeah. And her mom has one of those daggers. Violet doesn't realize what the dagger is for until she sees it on Zayden. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, so she knows that they exist. Obviously, she's a high up war general. But uh, it's just evidence for Violet. I feel like mm -hmm. that her mom's not telling her everything or hardly anything. So, well, totes. <laughs> totes. Sticking with this <laughs> line of discussion, I want to talk about, because we're talking about, you know, does... Violet's mom and Zayden see her strength before she does. And I do think, yes, for sure with Zayden. But if we're talking about Zayden and the mini kind of love triangle with Dane, who's her best friend. Yes. That was hard to, that was hard to watch. It was a real Tamlin situation. <laughs> it, it was, I was, it was so hard to listen to Dane. It was like, oh, that whiny, 
little bitch. I did <laughs> I don't know what else to call him because <laughs> the way he was talking to her and talking down to her. Oh, yeah. It's a lot of discussion about that. Zayden, I love that he observed so much more, you know, oh, yeah. from like you're talking about in the parapet. He immediately saw what she did with the shoe. And with the school that they're at, it's considered probably a weakness that she chose to befriend somebody and help them get right. across. Right. He was like, no, that's a strength. And so I was immediately like, mm, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the moment he walked onto the page, like page four, I'm all, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so yes. I like that he saw that as a strength versus a weakness when yes. everyone else in that school was like, don't be weak. Don't make friends. Don't try to help anyone out. You know, just you're going to lose your humanity, like all those things. And she's like, or I could do it a little different and do it my way. And I'm able to do both. She's clearly a manifesting generator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I'm going to do it different. Who knows? But yeah. better. And so I was really like, oh, I love this. But what's Dane doing? Because like, I think everyone gets that question mark possibly of, is this a love triangle? Oh, yeah. And I very quickly was like, well, I don't like that guy. Like, I hope it's not Dane. Yeah. Um, what is it do you find or what do you think it is? Because I've noticed this um, in books. Uh, fiction books specifically, where oftentimes the love interest, um, and it's maybe a more current trend, but they are super empowering to the female protagonist. Instead of being like, I will protect you and you are fragile. Like, I feel like we really got that in kind of the Twilight era. It it feels like there's been, uh, in a lot of books that have really taken off that people have loved, um, it feels like that idea of like supporting empowering that female protagonist and like encouraging her to live into her power well is is just this really adored theme in a, a character yeah and i noticed it most profoundly in the book i think when um when violet discovered her power her ability to yield lightning and when she does it when she discovers that she's defending someone that she cares about and she kills another initiate who is, I mean, it's like one of the ones where you're like, finally, that guy got killed because people are <laughs> dropping like flies in the book and you're like, that guy's the worst. Let's kill him. <laughs> um, and and she just is faced with like this conundrum of being like, I don't want to be a murderer, but my power is is literally violent. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that I was different. I thought that I would have the ability to like heal, but I had my ability is to just destroy and so she's faced with that, like, inner turmoil. Mm -hmm. And Dane, little bitch, he is. Dane comes in and he's like, he's like, it's okay. You don't ever have to use your power. You'll be fine. You never have to use it. Yeah. And Zayden comes in and he's like, don't lie to her. She absolutely will have to use that to protect her, for her country. People around her use her as a pawn. Like, they don't protect her from herself. Yeah. And... I don't know. I think that that's an interesting theme of like self-trust. Like you encourage, you, they want you, these male characters seem to like really encourage them to find their power. It probably helps that it's usually a female author writing it. Oh, 100%. <laughs> but no, for sure. I mean, I think we've all seen that. I don't, I don't know if the trend is the word I want to say. It's just this enlightenment of we ain't these fragile little women, right? Like as it's been portrayed, it's been in society. Um, that we can't handle things. We need men for everything, you know. And I think that that has been turned on its head. I I think a lot happened after COVID, honestly, that started these new movements. And before COVID, for sure, like the Me Too yeah. movement. Like there's all these things, uh, you know, if you look back and, and see what's uh, been the trend and the pattern, it's we're no longer going to be quiet about these things. And yeah. we are going to speak up. We do have power. And it's not that we don't need men. That's not the point. It's not that uh, we're all hyper-masculine women, also not the point. Um, I think it's just saying we are strong. We have power. It's different than how a man would probably portray that or speak that. Um, but the strength of a woman is different, but it's still power. It's still yeah. strength. And being able to really showcase that right now is Awesome, because it is allowing others to realize their power, like yeah. the everyday power, and to not just fall into societal norms that have been laid out for so long, right? Um, and I feel like yeah. you and I are 
kind of caught in the middle of all this and with our age. Oh, for sure. Like we were raised a certain way with certain uh, structures, um, beliefs, things like that. And it is flipping it. Everything's getting mm-hmm. flipped right now. And I'm like, yes, this is great. Also, it's hard to get out of my old pattern of thinking. But oh, yeah. Yay, feminism. <laughs> <laughs> we did, we're doing it. No, I think it's just, it's, I, I do appreciate in books just, um, I appreciate the inclusion of diversity and perspectives and what mm. people look like and how people think it, that it's not homogenous too, because I think the idea in literature, this push for more inclusion, um, what I really feel like I get from it is just that there's space for everybody to be themselves. Yeah. I feel like, uh, this, this trend for more inclusion just leaves space for people yeah. and um, people can see themselves in books. And I love that. And, um, and I love that, you know, you and I obviously can only come from the perspective of a woman, uh, in how we identify. But, um, I do love that when I read books like this, I feel more powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel more permission to be myself. Yeah. And, and I love when a book can do that for someone. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about how Violet has chronic pain. Mm. And I know you and I have both experienced chronic pain in our life and like physical chronic yeah. pain. I'm old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really. It's I'm, called aging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, I thought it was interesting uh, her, uh, you know, that disability as she describes it. Yeah. And um, how that played a part in in her not only being weaker than others, but also having more strength. Mm-hmm. And so I was I would love to hear your take on kind of how you felt like that played out in the book. Yeah. So I didn't know when I read the book because it's clear that, she, you know, Violet has something going on. Right. Like she kind of alludes to her you know, disability or weakness that's physically limiting for her yes. on top of just being kind of smaller um, that she needs. It's harder for her to jump further. It's harder for her to, you know, even climb up her dragon, stay on her dragon. And so <clears throat> when I was researching the book after I'd finished reading it, I didn't realize that the author, Rebecca Yaros, has the disorder, um, and I will try to pronounce it, that she wrote into Violet, Violet's character, which is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It's never explicitly stated, but when you read up on it, it's the exact same, like, uh, symptoms yes. you know things uh-huh. like that and it's it can cause joint pain and they like her joints can dislocate easily her skin can bruise easier she can bleed a little bit more than normal so those are some of the things that the syndrome actually has which the author has and she wrote into her character which i loved yeah um and she does a great job yaros of um including other diversity there's like different sexual orientations in the book um, we have a bisexual character, I believe, like in a non-binary character. Um, I think there's one uh, gay, like her best friend's gay, I think. Yeah, or no, bisexual. Uh, bisexual. Yeah, mm-hmm. so she's she's doing a lot of inclusion. And I've heard there's some spoilers for book two, Iron Flame, that there'll be a character that's possibly deaf as well. Oh, yes. A sister mm-hmm. to... Liam. Liam. Mm-hmm. And that they know sign language. So it's speculated. That's a prediction. We'll see. Yeah, it's speculated that she's deaf and so um i just really appreciate when they add these in in a really it feels natural way yeah it didn't feel forced by any means like it's just very subtly mentioned throughout the book and when you and the ways that like yeah we're different in a crowd like diversity you would see in a crowd of people and so i felt like it was really well done and i hope that people are reading it and they feel like they see themselves in the book i think that's kind of um the feeling i got with what rebecca was doing is like can people feel themselves in this? Mm-hmm. Um, I thought her, I found it fascinating that Rebecca, um, first of all, she wrote her experience, you know, like she has that experience of of overcoming this obstacle or of seeing that diagnosis that she yeah. has as also being a strength. And I felt like in the book, what I loved about it was there was a moment where uh, Violet is defending a baby dragon. and and darna i know and darna <laughs> she's so cute her like high little voice in the audio book yeah. too is so great so she's defending a dragon and she's like taking on three 
uh, initiates who are much stronger than her. They're def- bullies. They're bullies, to, and they're trying to kill this weakling. <laughs> I hate those bitchy bullies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. They're, <continue. laughs> they're trying to take on this, um, you know, they're, they're going to kill this baby dragon. Yeah. For, we're, we're, it's in the threshing. Yes. Yeah. And and she kind of says to them, like, they're like, I'm, you're so weak, I'm going to kill you. And, like, she kind of holds up, like, an injured arm that's, like, bleeding. And she's like, I'm used to pain. So, like, I have that going for me. Yeah. I, I have, I am strong because I'm able to endure in this pain. Mm-hmm. And I thought that that was such a powerful message. I think that's what Zayden sees in her. Yeah. And he's obviously there watching, like, trying to do his best. He's all, be cool, be cool, be cool. So be cool. He's like, don't you dare touch her. I loved that scene because, yeah, she, she's like, I'm used to pain. Are you, you know, kind of yeah. a thing and just launches it back at him. And I think anyone who's experienced either chronic pain or even mental illness, right? Like, you have to learn to endure things and overcome them and get through your daily life. Like, yeah. And so it's a different kind of endurance and strength that others who, you know, haven't had to go through that don't fully understand. Mm-hmm. And it is such a mental game, whichever yeah. one it is. And that is the strength of Violet is her mental fortitude to always keep going. And she, I was like amazed when she's like, block out the pain. I'm all, okay, I need to learn to do that. Because <laughs> she would just like, she had, like wrecked her like ankle and she'd been stabbed. She'd been bruised and she's just like, block it out. And I'm all, maybe that's just adrenaline, but how do I do that? You know? You're like, I need to meditate more. <laughs> yeah. So for sure. I'm just like, you have to work. She, well, in the book, right? She has to work twice, three times as hard as any other initiative mm-hmm. just to stay up with everybody else. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, yay, clapping over here. Oh, that was such a badass scene. I love that scene. The threshing scene. Yeah. Where she bonds with her dragon for the first time, her dragons. And dragons, plural. Yes. So in the book, there are three sexy scenes I can think of. There's the first kiss, <laughs> which is like they're having like a cigarette to overcome the lust of the two dragons having sex. Dude. <laughs> I know. It is what it is. Do you just think the baby dragon somewhere like, what the hell is he up in here? Oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> right? Because she's telepathically connected. It's so she's a, probably like, this is a lot. <laughs> it's a whole sexual situation. I don't know if there's a guidebook for it. I kind of wait. Well, I was just like, obviously, I thought for sure there was going to be a sex scene in the book where the dragons are having sex again and Violet and Zayden can't stop themselves. And <laughs> that's how they have sex for the first time. But that doesn't happen in... In book one. I was going to say, this is supposedly a five book series. So yes. we're making predictions. It's going to happen. Yeah. And we were like sex predictions. Dragon, human, <laughs> hyper sex is going to happen. <laughs> it's so awkward talking about it, but it'll be yeah. awesome. Right? It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's true. But you kind of have to talk about it because you're like, I, I have some thoughts. I immediately texted when I got to that part, I immediately texted Allie and I was like, are they going to have dragon human sex? And she was just like laughing emojis. Uh, a friend and, of ours who had read the book before us. Yeah. We were like, we have predictions. Yes. But uh, the first sex scene I thought was interesting because it was on the tail end of people coming into Violet's room mm. to assassinate her, essentially, because mm. her mom... People don't really like Violet's mom. She's like not popular. No, she's not warm and fuzzy by any means. No. And so a lot of the things that her mom did, they kind of want to take it out on Violet. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, they, she's about to be assassinated. And Xander comes in just in time because the dragon's telepath's clear. Like, she's in danger. You must get to her. Zayden, yeah. Zayden. Oh, sorry. I keep saying Xander. I know. It's because it's spelled too. with an X. And yeah. so you're like, ah, oh, okay, Zayden. And so he shows up. And he's like, you're all dead. Yeah. And I was all panties dropped. <laughs> I, Something about murder. Just does it for me, right? Yeah. Um, but yes, that's like the first time you see how much he cares for her, I think. Oh, yeah. But you, you go well, his like his. No, I don't have any. Oh. I was like, we're riffing. This is great. <laughs> no. But his whole like composure just falls because mm. he's quite guarded. Yes. And a lot of the book. But then in that moment, he's like fully filleted open yeah. in his vulnerability and you're just like no. <laughs> yeah. numb <laughs> numb <laughs> yeah well i mean if you read the book i'm hoping everyone who's read it who's gotten this far um <laughs> i hope everyone enjoyed those steamy scenes like just their kiss you know outside like we talked about their first time being intimate together and then they have you know some subsequent moments mm-hmm. of spending time together but uh, it was 
I mean, it's clearly her bread and butter. She's so great at writing those moments. Oh, at like writing the, the tension. Intimacy. Oh, yes. Uh, so just where would you put it in the spice meter? Um, one I to five. a two. Yeah. A two to a 2.5. Yeah. 2.5 yeah. is like what I went to as well. I'm like, yeah. we're just going to do quarter stars. It's fine. We're making this we'll up. We'll do whatever we want. <laughs> yeah. um, so the writing was descriptive, but it's yeah. by no means like yeah. overall like a huge part of the book. It is the tension. Yes. Yes. But like the actual scenes are, you know. Yes. And um, I will say in that first uh, sex scene, they... It's like in her dorm room and there's like lots of broken furniture and yeah. everything. So I thought she did a good way. She wrote it well in that it was like an intense sex scene. But I felt like it was really enjoyable and tastefully done. And and I don't know. I felt like the culmination of the tension. I was really pleased with it. And, <laughs> and I felt like it felt really organic in the story. Because um, sometimes I know you can pivot so hard into a sex scene that you're like, this doesn't even feel like their personalities. Yeah. Uh, like it'll go immediately to like, like dirty talk or like uh. something that's really intense that you would see in a romance novel. And I felt like this definitely kept uh, the sex scene in line with the characters. Mm. And I loved, um, they felt like a 20 year old and a 23 year old, yeah. you know, they, they felt very true to their age and their experience. And so I really loved it. And then the second sex scene I thought was really sweet because they were in a very vulnerable situation. They didn't, you know, he carries a lot of responsibility because his parents were executed for rebellion. Mm -hmm. And he is one of the oldest uh, children of the rebels that's in this academy. And he kind of has this self-proclaimed responsibility to keep them all alive, to help them and to support them. And, and he's kind of like a like a leader, a uncle figure to a lot of these mm -hmm. these kids. And so I think he just feels that pressure. And I loved how they were able to emotionally connect in the sex scenes where she was like kind of able to show him how important he is mm. to her and and how his effort matters. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really sweet. I really loved the second one. So, OK, so for our final question, I want to ask after the final dramatic fight scene, there's a change in the point of view from Violet to Zayden. Obviously, it was clear in the audiobook. Mm. Um, you're like, oh, a dude's reading now. Okay, this is Zayden. <laughs> What's going on? So why do you think that Rebecca made that switch so late in the book? Why didn't we get his perspective throughout the book? Why did we get it right at the end? What are your thoughts on that? I don't obviously know. These are just my thoughts and guesses here. But um, one thought was uh, it was very purposeful that we were only getting Violet's perspective because we're supposed to feel j just like Violet, right? In that... Zayden feels guarded. We don't know what he's thinking, mm -hmm. what's going on behind, you know, what his eyes. That uh, sexy exterior. What's happening there. Yeah. <laughs> and so I wondered if we're supposed to be feeling that same shut out kind of experience that Violet is experiencing. And at the very, very end, you get that vulnerable moment where you get to read his thoughts and how he's feeling about the situation and how Violet, you know, she's been out for three days, poisoned after this battle. And, um, and then all of a sudden it's his point of view and you get to see the panic that he's feeling yeah. and he's vulnerable and he's, he's so afraid for Violet and what does this mean for them? And, and she going to be okay. And the pressure I feel. And so I was like, okay, maybe it's just that little glimpse so that we kind of, you know, let the steam out a little bit and see where he's really coming from. Because mm -hmm. up until that point they were fighting a little bit, right? Cause he finally, well, he was keeping from her, keeping it secret from yeah. her that he was part of, of the rebellion, the new rebellion, yes. essentially, um, and that the government that her mom is a part of is corrupt in mm -hmm. his mind, and they have some evil corruptions in them, which I think that's kind of where the whole book two is leading, and I'm really excited about it. Yeah, um, but I think it switches to his perspective. I love that it shows um, how committed to Violet he is, because Violet is like, we're done. Yeah, like she feels so betrayed and lied to, uh, and so while she joins this rebellion that her brother's a part of and she finds that out um, and she's willing to fight for innocence, the innocent uh, she's feels so betrayed by him. And so I thought it was a really great literary tool to put his perspective in at the end, because I think you get the sense of like his humanity, why he would not tell her, you yeah. know, his fear that Dane would see everything about the rebellion that he knows, because if he shared it with Violet and Dane got close to her and touched her 
he would be able to read her mind. And so I have thoughts on that because give it to me. I was reading somebody in the fan world did it. The calculation. Dane touched her 33 times. Ew. <laughs> where he could touch her and sense what she was thinking, right? That's his signet. That's his power. Yes. He can read your thoughts, but he has to touch you. But he would always do it in a really light way versus like, you know, sticking his hands to her forehead or something. Versus like Magneto helmet. Yes. <laughs> it was like, even if he just like touched her here or here. And she didn't realize that until Zayden was like, did Dane touch you right before you came on this mission? And she's like, yeah, but just like this. And he was like, and there it is. Yeah. And so somebody went back and realized Dane had it like inadvertently touched her. Well, sorry. It was purposeful probably on his end 33 times where he was probably getting that information without her realizing and violating yeah. her memories. And her trust. And oh my gosh, he's a little bitch. I just <laughs> can't get enough of that. And so I also am wondering, and this is another prediction, if book two, I wonder if it switches perspectives. Like I wonder if we get like Zayden's for pers- a chunk of it. That's another thought. Who knows? I so. would love that. I think that'd be fun. Yeah. I'm really excited for Iron Flame because there's all these fun predictions. I think there's been a lot, another prediction that the school's going to burn down or that they will burn it down. Hence, like, there's like the tagline under it about, oh, now I can't remember something like let it burn Ooh. and Iron Flame. Yeah. Because the school's so corrupt. Or it could be like letting the government burn. Yeah. It's like that a whole too. Hunger Games sitch. Like, I don't mm-hmm. know. So, and we don't know, yeah, what's happening with Brennan. He's not dead. He's alive, people. And he's a healer. And he's a healer. He's going to help. He helped heal. Well, okay. So the reason that got revealed to Violet is that's what saved her is because they're like, I know a talented, Zayden's like, I know a talented healer. Yeah. And it's her brother. I just love in books when like the love interest is best friends with the older brother. I'm like, it's the safety I wish I had. <laughs> yeah. They're just like, we will defend her to the death. I know. It'll be, I'm excited. And then in Darna at the very end. Oh, yeah. She's big. She's used up our power. You know, she's I don't think she's a feather tail anymore in the sense of like a, a youngling. And she's big. And so she's going to wield some intense power, I bet. Yes. So I'm excited to see what happens there. And I'm sure we're going to learn more about like her mother. And is she good or is she evil? Yes. Hoping that gets a little more clear. Do you up. feel like her dad's for sure dead? I'm like, dead people just give him back to life. At this point, I wouldn't be surprised if somehow he was also on the rebellion side. Like... Who knows? Like he died. I'd and love also, to hear and, I know. And I would get there and be like, what the hell, guys? Like everybody just left her behind. And Miriam, like she's still, for all we know, yeah. is she in the dark? Did she know? Yeah. So lots of questions. Yeah. Maybe her dad faked his death. I don't know. Well, I'm also like, there's also, there's not a lot of like prophecy in the book, but I wonder if there is something about her and her specifically being like a chosen one. Because we see that a lot in fantasy books where someone's like a chosen one. Mm-hmm. And and I wonder if even if her dad is alive, if he kind of created this opportunity to for her to go into the school. Like if the, her dad and mom were in on it together. Yeah. Knowing that she had some role to fulfill. Well, that'd be cool. So many theories. I know. I love book it. Book two will like give us some more oh, tasty yeah. treats. Very excited. And some people who are listening to this, you'll already have dug into book two. So I'm so jealous. Because We're comes so out. close. I know. We're so okay. close. A couple weeks out. Yeah. But anyways. And maybe we'll do a follow-up book club on Iron Flame book two in the series because yes. um, if there's going to be five books, yeah, let's do it. Let's keep doing this. <laughs> Okay. Well, that's all for this episode. And And as an announcement, oh yes, um, next book club uh, episode, our next book club episode is going to be Divine Rivals Mm, by Rebecca Ross. Yep. So we interviewed Rebecca in an episode, but we also loved that book and it was so good. So we'll be chatting about that in our next book club episode. Awesome. Thank you, readers. All right, reader, thank you for listening to the Lit Joy podcast. Make sure to rate and review us. And like a good book, don't forget to recommend us to your friends.